as we have already said, we had a wonderful week at Refresh this week. And uh, I, I think it's kind of cool because uh, we really get to do some, some different things. And my opinion, this is, this is Pastor Dale's opinion, and it doesn't have to be anybody else's opinion, but it's mine. Um, I think the Western New York District of the Wesleyan Church has the best family camp bar none. Okay? Uh, we have been to multiple different family camps throughout the years in different places in Shenandoah and uh, what is now the Northeast District and Eastern Michigan, what is now uh, uh, what, what is now the Great Lakes region. We've been to camps everywhere. But the camp in Western New York is absolutely amazing. Um, they, we, and, and even when it comes to other things, what Western New York is doing is um, the way that I feel like it, it's, it's great because we go, to, we go to district functions and we've been to other district functions where, where, the, where the pastors of the big church are like, well, I'm a pastor of a big church and you're just one of those scrawny little churches and they kind of like, it's kind of like the nose thing, but I think it's cool because we, you know, we can, I can talk to Pat Jones and Ken Nash and um, Kevin Beers. All these guys are pastoring churches that are, that are 2,000 people, and they'll just talk like regular, normal people, and they'll reach you. They won't, it's, it's so cool. But one of the highlights of Refresh, for me at least, is, is every morning at 9.30, we gather in the atrium of the Chamberlain Center, and Dr. Dr. Steve Dunmire grabs his acoustic guitar, and, and so I, for, for one of the reasons that I love, love, love Refresh and, and is just because watch Steve Dunmire play the guitar and lead worship. Um, he plays, and I'm just sitting there. Like, and so at one point this week I went, how did you do that? Um, I went up and just asked him how he did it. And, um, <coughs> but then we, you know, we got the cello and the, the acoustic bass and all kinds of things. And, um, and then after the musical worship, about 20 minutes of musical worship, we go, in, we go into seminars. And one of the seminars that I attended this year uh, was called A Novel Approach to reading scriptures. Did you know that the Bible is really unique, um, it, and especially for its time? Um, up, until, up until the time of the Bible, um, Bible the writing wasn't written the way it is, is now. And the Bible is an amazing collection of stories that are many times told in a rapid fire succession. So instead of the Bible being a full length feature film, <clears throat> we can think of it more as YouTube videos. You know, they're, they're short, to the point, economic storytelling. But not only does the Bible tell these stories, these amazing and fascinating stories, and, and before I get too far, you know, because we're gonna talk about being a, 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 this novel approach to a scripture, I want to, to assure you that I do not believe, because most times when you think of novels, you think of fiction. I want to assure you that the Bible is not fiction. It is true. It is God's Word. Um, it has some amazing stories in it. Before, before the Bible came into being, we had stories like um, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Has anybody ever tried to plow their way through an epic yeah, it's not fun. It's the Bible when, especially when it comes to the story parts of the Bible, the Bible is really much easier to read. One of the more intriguing stories comes early on, and we're going to take a look at that. And last week we looked at this idea of spy flicks. Well, this morning would be more like uh, what we would call a suspense. And a suspense, you know, we, we've heard about thrillers and suspense films. And a suspense film is when you as the watcher or the reader of the book know what's going to happen and the person who is in the story doesn't. You know, it, and, and really, um, one of the things, I, what I want you to do as we look at this story um, this morning, I want you to, to try to hear this story as if you were hearing it for the first time. We're, we're very familiar with this particular story, but 
I want you to try to put those, put, put, put away what you know about the story. And I want you to listen to it like you were hearing it for the first time. And imagine what your reaction would be. Genesis 22. 1 through 14 is where we're going to be. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham called. Abraham, God called. Yes, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with them, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for the fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood and the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar at the top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And they, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. And so he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place Yahweh or Jehovah, Yaira or Jaira, which means the Lord will provide. Now, it's really easy for us who have heard the story from, from the time we were this little to now to say, oh, yeah, we know, we know what this story is all about. But before I, and, and, you know, we also might think, well, what kind of God would require a sacrifice of, of one's own child? Now, let me bring, take you to, to, some, to some background material. In Canaan, the Canaanites, remember the Canaanites, they were a pagan people, and one of the things that the pagan people of the Canaanites believed was that their god, Molech, believed in child sacrifice. And you would sacrifice your child to the god Molech and place your baby, your child, in a furnace to be burnt up. So for Abram to get this news from God wouldn't been, have been completely shocking to him as it is to us. For us, this is much more shocking. But God has put, God puts Abraham to the test. Whether Abraham was comfortable with it or not, sacrificing your child to a god would be a difficult thing to do. With that in mind, let's look. There is a short dialogue found there. And God, God says to Abraham, Abraham, Abraham says, here I am. And then he says four things, four bullet points. He says, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, the one whom you love so much. 
In case Abram had any mistake as to what son was to be sacrificed, the Lord is very clear. Because you may remember that Abraham has another son. His name is Ishmael. But he says these four things to make it very clear to Abraham that he wants Isaac. And God tells Abraham to go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Now, if you look at that scripture, if, if you're there in, in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 22, here's what you're going to notice. Right after that happens, there's no more dialogue. It's just done. God says, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. So sometime the day before, God talks to Abraham, and then the scripture is completely silent. And the next morning, the scripture picks up and it says, Abraham got up early, he saddled his donkey, took his servants with him, along with the son Isaac. Just goes on telling in this very matter-of-fact manner what is going to happen. What was Abraham feeling at this time? We don't know. How would you be feeling at this time? You'd probably be pretty heavy-hearted, wouldn't you? Um, thinking that God had asked you. And not only that, but in three sentences, we get from Abram saddled his donkey to three days later, Abraham stopped, and we pick up a little dialogue there. And he tells the servants... And in, in the Hebrew, I was, I was, this was one of the stories that I'd, I'd already been planning on preaching this for today. Um, but when I was in this, this particular class, um, Jason Schombach was telling us about the story. And in the Hebrew, where Abram tells his two servants to stay, it almost reads like this. You two lads stay here while I take this lad and I will be back. It's almost as if the grief is too much for Abraham. That he is going to be taking his son and sacrificing him. So he calls, in order to impersonalize it a little bit, he calls him this lad. Imagine. Imagine what that feels like. And even the we will that, that, that we see in the scriptures is implied, but it's not really clear in the Hebrew. Did Abram know that he ultimately was going to bring Isaac back with him? We don't know. And again, the story falls silent. And it's broken by Isaac asking his father. His, Isaac is curious. I mean, he's old enough probably to know what's going on. He says, Dad... We got the fire, we got the wood, but we're missing something. Obviously, Isaac had seen enough sacrifices to know that something was missing. And Abraham replies, the Lord himself will provide a lamb. I confess to you, as our speaker said all week, confession is good for the soul, but bad for the reputation. I confess to you, I don't know that I would have been able to do what Abraham did. God himself will provide a lamb. And the dialogue ends, and then the scripture continues to tell the story in this very dry matter-of-fact fashion until they arrive at Mount Moriah and then it slows down one of the modern filmmaking effects and we even see it in in sports is to go frame by frame by frame and the story right here slows so much down when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go Abraham built an altar, and arranged the wood on it. 
And then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar at the top of the wood. And Abram picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, Lord. Put the knife down. Can, can you imagine how Abraham was shaking at this point? I'm sure as soon as he got his, he, he may have even just pulled his hand back far enough that he could drop it straight on the ground. Abram replies to the angel, and the angel tells him to stop. God says, the angel says, God knows that you love him and you fear him because you were not even, you did not even hold your own son away from God. It also proves us another thing. I, I, I often wonder if, if God didn't do this particular, uh, what seems to us incredible thing of sacrificing a son to say, Abraham, you waited 99 years for a son. Is your son an idol to you? And when Abraham was willing to give up his son, God said, no. I understand. You really, you really love me, and your son is not import, more important to you than I am. Let him live. I love what happens. Immediately, Abraham looks up. Right there. In the thicket. God provided a lamb. A lamb. A ram. What about us? Do we, do we have idols that we keep from God? Do we have, do we have things that are, are more important to God than God himself? That God would say, you know what? This morning as you get ready to take communion, will you give that up? At the beginning of the story, God tells Abraham four things. He says, take your son, your only son, the one whom you love, yes, Isaac. I want you to think about another father who took his only son, his son, the one whom he loved, Jesus. Abram said many 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years before Jesus was on the earth, Abraham said, God will provide a lamb. Jesus arrives on the scene as God's son, as God's only son, the one whom God loves. sacrificial lamb. Even John the Baptist says, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Abram told Isaac that God will provide a lamb, the lamb that is the sinless, spotless lamb of God, God's only son, the one whom he loved, Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, actually let me go with the 8 first. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. And there he ministers in the heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord. 
and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifice, our priest must make an offering too. And then chapter 9, verse 11 of Hebrews. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once and for all times and secured our redemption forever. I don't think you guys heard that. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Amen. Good one. God has provided the lamb. His name is Jesus. This morning as we prepare for communion, as we in community remember that God indeed did indeed provide a lamb for us. Let's prepare our hearts as we hear this song.